you spell it. And she's going to talk about group intervention for struggling students. And backgrounds uh, on the handle. This was uh, made up by Tina two years ago. She came up with the idea. But we decided not to do G-L-A-S-S, because then it would say assy, and that would probably not be my students it. So anyway, um, my name is Kat. I work in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys because I'm going to uh, tell you about some interventions I came up to, um, with a couple years ago to help my students who were uh, failing my class. And I'm hopeful that some of these might be useful for you guys with your students. So, um, some context. Two years ago, um, we had all of our students in ninth grade um, come in, and rather than being tracked into two classes, they were all taking an honors level course. Um, and for the students, it's a 9 through 12 school. They come, it's a magnet school. They come from all parts of New York City. Um, and for many of them, it's a real shock to come because they're used to just kind of coasting through, being the top of their class. Um, and then they get to our school, and it's like, ah, I need to study. And, um, and for, for a lot of them, they really struggle. Um, and halfway through the year, I was realizing that my normal interventions that I used were just not working for about two dozen students, and they were failing my course. So I tried in-class scaffolding and differentiation, lots of phone calls home, one-on-one -on -one conferencing, um, extensions, everything I felt like, and it still just wasn't clicking, so I knew I had to try something different. So what I came up with was pretty simple, um, and that's why I want to share it with you guys because it wasn't a lot of effort, but it had a big impact, which is my favorite kind of thing to do. So I had a, a goal-setting meeting with the group of students who were failing my course, and then I had mandatory weekly after-school sessions, um, and in this process, I developed some new mindsets about how I approach these students that I want to share with you guys. The reason mandatory is in quotation marks is because at my school, we can't actually really force students to stay after school, so I had to highly encourage them um, through relationship building and buy-in and um, bribery with some points if they, um, if they attended all the sessions and were on time. So in this process, um, I kind of rethought the way I help these students. So the first one was that the goals that I had for them were way less important than the goals that they had for themselves. So here's just, and I'll, I'll share this, but um, this is just a little screenshot of some um, things we worked on together on a goal setting worksheet. So what I would do is I had the students come in, gave them all a laptop, um, and had them open up their, um, their grade report, their grades on, online. So the thing is that this has actually been open to them all year and available to them. But for many of the students, they were so stressed out that they were failing my class, and they were just in avoidance, and they didn't even want to look online to see what their grades were. Um, and I see some of you guys nodding that you've had this experience with your students. So like, they kind of know, I have kind of this percentage, but they, they'd rather just not know the details. So we took out the laptops, they all looked at it, they just went through, analyzed it, reflected on it, talked about what they were doing well, what they needed to, um, what they were struggling with. And then I had them come up with three commitments or goals um, that they thought they could achieve that would help them improve their grade. Um, and we talked about setting good goals, we talked about making them achievable, we talked about making them specific. Um, but here's where I really had to push myself to let those goals really truly be my students and not my own. Because it was so much more powerful when they felt ownership over the goals that they set. And I really had to resist the urge to just look and be like, ah, it's so obvious, you need to do your homework, you know, your homework grade is so low. But I knew that my students would just not feel ownership over their goals unless they came up with them themselves. And many times those goals actually matched the ones I had for them. Sometimes they didn't, and I just had to be comfortable with, it was more important for them to actually feel ownership of the goals that they had for themselves. That way when I held them accountable throughout the semester, it really felt like a partnership and not just me scolding them about what I thought that they should do. The second was this. I decided that failing grades should not be a bad phrase. Um, I have a journalism background, and in journalism, when you write a news story, you always avoid jargon. So if the interview subject gives you a word that's even really common in their field, you translate it for the reader so they know what you're talking about, and you can be as direct as possible. And I realized that I was using so many code words for failing. I was saying struggling students, students who need support, uh, students who are not on track, all these code words, and I realized that I was messaging to students that 
to have a failing grade is really shameful and so shameful that I, I was scared to use the word. So when they came to that meeting, I was really respectful, but I was also really direct. And I just said, you guys are here because right now you have a failing grade in my class. And we're going to change that together. We're going to work together. We're going to come up with some goals to change that. And I also said, I'm not having this meeting in secret. We're having it as a group together so that you know that you shouldn't be ashamed. First of all, it's just that we need help and we need to work together. And also so that you know who else is in the same situation so that you can support each other. That was really nice because then during the semester, I really saw them work together as a team. And in class, they would help keep each other on task. They would help remind each other to come to my weekly sessions. Um, there were some students who struggled with being on time, and so I saw their friends really saying, like, you got to be there. So it was neat to see that develop. Then the last change I made was to swap reviewing with previewing. So maybe you've had this experience when you reteach a skill that your students struggled with. And if you reteach it the same way, maybe you're frustrated afterwards because they're making the same mistakes. Or if you reteach it a new way, maybe you're frustrated because they have new misconceptions. I'm not saying that remediation is bad and we should stop remediating, but I realized that with this group of students, previewing actually had a much bigger impact than reviewing. So what I would do is I would take the lessons that were coming up for the next couple of days, and I would uh, take a skeleton of those lessons and just give them a preview of what was coming up in class. And even in just that 40 minute session, I saw a huge change in how they worked their mindset in class. Because they came in already feeling successful and that way they could still engage in the discovery lessons, the discussions, the difficult tasks, but just with so much more of an entry point. So they were discussing more with their partners, they were helping their partners, they were participating more in class. I even saw them taking more notes, kind of sitting up more in class, just more engaged when I switched to previewing. Um, so with these changes, I was able to reduce um, the number of students who were failing my class. A couple did still need to go to summer school um, but I was able to drop that number by 75%. And, and um, those, those students really became my favorites. And I'm hopeful that um, some of these strategies might be useful for you guys, for your students. So thank you so much.